The longer I live, the more I see that people's religion, their concept of God, their understanding of salvation, and the afterlife tends to be more guided by cultural trends and entertainment media than from the Word of God. That's not something totally new. In fact, it's been a long time since Dante penned his Inferno, part of his divine comedy, in which he depicts the levels of hell. And of course, it was a social commentary more about the French government at the time. And yet today, a lot of people, when they talk about heaven or when they talk about hell, they are immediately drawn to the concepts, not of the Bible, but more about Dante's Inferno. We see in movies, not long ago, I guess it's been a long time ago, it just seems like a few years ago, but I had a cousin one time come to me and he asked me, you know, since I was a theologian, what I thought about the stigmata. And I had to admit to him that I had never up to that point heard of the stigmata. And he proceeded to tell me all about it based upon a movie that he saw instead of anything that he, of course, had read in the scriptures. And it's not just about the end of times, but it seems that Hollywood and entertainment seems to mold and sculpt our ideas of religion. And sadly, even when it comes to the church. I think nowhere do we see this as, as, uh, uh, as openly as, as we do about the realm in the Bible of things that are unknown. God spoke in Deuteronomy 29 and verse 29, there were certain things which were secret that belonged to Him. In other words, He has revealed unto us the mysteries of life that we need to know that pertain to our life and godliness, 2 Peter 1 and verse 3. But in no way could God reveal to us every bit of knowledge and wisdom that He Himself holds. Do you remember he was able to stump Job himself when he asked him the question, Were you there when I hung the world upon nothing? When I laid the foundations of the world? Were you there when I taught the birds how to lay eggs and the animals how to give birth? Were you there? Job, do you have the knowledge that I have? So we understand there are certain things which God has a knowledge of and wisdom of, experience of, that he refers to maybe in passing in his scriptures and doesn't develop fully for us. As a result, we come to the, those hidden passages, we might say, the things that are not fully revealed, and we like to embellish a little bit and tell the story a little bit deeper. And so, we have entertainment writing for us the Word of God. When it comes to the devil... Jesus would tell them in John chapter 8 and verse 44, You are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. Jesus warns us that the devil himself is a liar and a murderer. He is uh, not accustomed to the truth. He speaks of his own character, out of his own nature, when, when he speaks a lie. It's impossible for the devil to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And yet in, in modern media, and even in, in old media, the devil is depicted as... A, a sprite or a character. He is red. He has his pitched fork. Uh, he has his tail and, and uh, uh, the forked tongue and all the ways that he's described for us. Whether you're looking at uh, the Daniel or the devil in Daniel Webster or Faust Tell or, or or whatever it is, even even the the blue devil, the, the you know different from the red devil. And we tend to have, have put a, a smiling face on evil. And yet Jesus wants us to know that the devil is real and that he is dangerous. Peter would warn in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 
We, re we read those words and I think sometimes we're not as terrified of the devil and his power as we ought to be. The fact is, the devil is not only real, but he is actively seeking our downfall. He is not con content to let any one of us, as Christians, survive this present age and make it into the glorious afterlife. He's after every single one of us. And so we see that the devil is real. But you know, in the Bible, there is a difference between the devil and his demons. Tonight we want to take some time and look at the nature of demons. What are they? Where do they come from? What does the Bible have to say about it? You know, a lot of us, uh, 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 what we understand and know about demons is based more upon Hollywood than the Holy Bible. So we look and see what it says. One of the first things that we understand about demons is they are not the devil. The Bible very clearly makes a distinction between diabolos or diabolos and the daimonia. The daimonia are the demons and the diabolos is the devil. Diabolos is one who is our adversary. The word, the Greek word, means one who is a calumniator, one who is conspiring against us. The Greek word Satan, from where we get the name Satan, means adversary. He is one who is standing against us. And he's always depicted as one particular individual. That he is, in fact, singular. And we see him in the Garden of Eden, tempting Adam and Eve. You shall surely not die, he would whisper to her. She would be tempted and fall away and lead her husband astray as well because of the temptation of the devil. That is different than the demons which he controls. We know that he's not the devil. We look at, or we know that demons are not the devil because uh, uh, the devil in Job chapter 1 comes and stands before God. Uh, again, it is an individual personality. It is a being. Not only does he exist, but he has movement, he has action, he has, he has the ability to affect people. But again, it's in the singular, even we see in Job chapter 1. We see in Matthew chapter 4 that the devil comes and he begins to tempt Jesus. Again, singular, he is the devil, not demons. You know, some translations of the English Bible fail to make the distinction between the devil and demons. If you read in an English translation the plural devils, that is a translation of daimonia, and not a translation of diabolos. They are distinct beings, different from one another. In fact, we would say that the devil is in control of his demons, that he stands in authority over them. And then we see there in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, the devil is seen as one in particular fellow who is as a roaring lion, or uh, he's prowling, seeking whom he may devour. So we know that he's not, that, that demons are not the devil. They are a, a distinct group of people. But I also want us to understand that they are not departed men. This tends to be a lot of people's concepts when it comes to demons. That bad people, when they die, their souls are released, and those wicked, evil souls become the demons that inhabit the, the angelic realm or that, that affect and impact the earth. But I'm here to tell you that the demons that are under the control of the devil are not departed men. They're not the souls or the spirits of those who are wicked and sinful and immoral when they die. We're not talking about disembodied ghosts. We're talking about beings which were created by God at the beginning of the, of the world. And we know that they're not men because the Bible so clearly makes a distinction between them. For example, uh, they, they are called angels. Notice in Revelation 12 and verse 9 it says, uh, The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent. Well, we know that the ancient serpent from Genesis chapter 3 is the devil himself. He is also referred to as the great dragon. 
the next phrase in the verse, who is called the devil. So we know, we have absolutely no doubt that he's talking about the devil, who is the serpent, who is the dragon, the devil, and also called in this verse, Satan. So we have nearly the, 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 all the names or the major references to the devil are included right here so that we will not be deceived, that we will not be confused. He is the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to this earth and his angels were thrown down with him. There we see in that verse or that particular verse that, that there is a distinction between the devil and the angels. But we know that when the devil was cast out of heaven, the man was not in existence yet. That creation had not occurred. We know that when he was thrown down, that his angels, his demons, his minions were thrown down with him. They far predate the souls of wicked men. So we know that they're not departed men because they are called angels and they were, were cast out of heaven. Jude would tell us, in Jude verse 6, the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Who has he kept there? Angels. Not the angels which God is using as messengers and those who would influence and bless the saints and minister unto them in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. But we're talking about those evil, wicked angels which were cast down or thrown down to the earth that did not stay within, notice, their first state. What was their first state? In heaven with God. That's where they were. God did not spare them this fate. And of course, Jude would go on to explain, if he didn't spare them, how's he going to spare us? In 2 Peter, I mentioned Jude. In 2 Peter, I'm sorry, they were not spared. In 2 Peter 2 and verse 4, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them into chains of gloom, or in gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, uh, uh, God did not spare those angels that were cast out. How is he going to spare wicked men? So angels or, or demons are not departed souls of human beings. They were beings which were created at the foundation of the world. And they have certain areas or spheres of influence. What's interesting is when we go to the Bible, there are limitations that are put upon angels as a whole whether they're good angels or they're bad angels or what we would commonly refer to as demons. And those limitations define for us what we may refer to as their power. What is their power? You know, we know the devil is, is seeking whom he may devour. He is prowling around like an angry lion. He is hungry and he's ready to pounce on any one of us. The question is, is what kind of power do the demons have? And the answer in the Bible is that their power is very similar to that of angels who are ministering spirits to the saints. And just as an angel of God or angel of light would come to us and bless us and seek to minister us and help us in our quest for the heavenly glory, it is the devil's angels that come to us and tempt us and draw us away after our lust and attempts to get us to miss heaven for all of eternity. Let's look at just a little, a few points about their power. First of all, the Bible says that they are numerous. You know, we talk about the numerous hosts of heaven. The angels are in a certain realm in which they can pass from, from heaven to this earth behind a veil that human eyes cannot see. And within that veil or behind that veil, they are able to uh, minister to, to impact the lives of Christians in ways that we may not be able to say with definitiveness that that was the touch of an angel's hand. We may not be able to identify exactly what the angel's touch is versus providence of God, but they are behind the veil ministering for our benefit and our salvation. And they are numerous. Thankfully, we are not limited to a single solitary guardian angel. I take comfort in knowing that there's more than just one ministering saint looking after me or ministering spirit looking after me. But 
you know, just as there is numerous angelic hosts of the angels of light, there is a numerous host of angels of darkness. Daniel prayed at one time to God, and God sent Michael, his angel, to, to go and minister to Daniel. Along the way, one of the dark angels, one of the demons, clashed with him and hindered him to an, to an extent that when he came, he, was, he came to Daniel in the vision and told him that the, the prince of Persia, which was a reference to the demons of, of Persia, stood in my way and hindered me. You see, there are numerous hosts, even of the evil angels, the demons which are seeking to destroy us. Of course, we ultimately have the choice of doing right or doing wrong. We have the choice of giving in to the lust that those demons would tempt us into or to stay strong and take the, the opportunity to, to follow God in His way of escape. But do not think that there's only one or two or a handful. But there are millions and millions of minions of the devil which are seeking our downfall. That in itself is a great power. Especially if we don't think that it's going to affect us. Let him that thinks he stand take heed lest he fall, 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Secondly, when we think about their power, we recognize that they have access to the earth. In Job 1, where was, it the, where was the devil before he came to stand before God? He says that I was up on the earth walking to and fro. What do you suppose he's doing walking on the earth, walking to and fro? Well, he was seeking to lead men astray. But he's doing it not just by himself, but he's doing it with the realm of angels or demons that he has at his beck and call. And they have access to this earth. And again, we may not perceptively see them, but we do see the effects of what they bring. Sin, immorality, debauchery, those things. We also see that these demons operate on the minds and the hearts of men. Think about Ephesians chapter 2 when he, he, he talks about, and such were some of you, and he's talking about how they had been changed. And, and in those first three verses, he, he uh, identifies for us those who were children of the, or who walked according to the principalities and the powers, the rulers of the air. We, I know that sounds a lot like Ephesians 6, but here in Ephesians 2, he says, uh, uh, you who were dead in your trespasses and sins, who, in which you once walked following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Those spirits, those, those uh, inclinations that work in the sons of disobedience, that lead them in, uh, astray, that, that blind their mind, that cover their eyes to the righteousness of God. They operate on the hearts and the minds of men. And of course, Ephesians 6, when, when he says that we are to put on the whole armor of God, because we are told we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against uh, the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Very reminiscent of Roman, uh, Revelation 12 and verse 9 where we saw that he is the, uh, the adversary, that he is the, the devil, he is Satan, he is the one who is accusing us. All referring to the same being. Here again we see that they are referring the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers of the present darkness, these forces of evil. These are the demons. And he says, that's who we are fighting against, are these demons. And so they operate on the hearts and the minds of men. And we have to be aware of that. And guard ourselves against their fiery darts as if we put on the whole armor of God. But we would say this, that they are limited by natural law on this earth. Just, they work within the, the natural order of things. But you see, they don't have to do miracles. They don't have to move the coffee cup across the table to have damage and control in your hearts and minds. They need only to bring opportunity for you to engage in the lust of your flesh. And that is more terrifying than a shaking mirror or a slamming door. 
in Revelation 20, there is that picture of the devil having been caught and bound with a chain and cast into the bottomless pit or the abyss. And he is there for what, the thousand years? Which time he will be released and then he'll be captured and cast into the, the fire, the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. Which is reserved not just for him, but for his angels. Where is he now, though? He's bound in a chain. That's today. He's at the bottomless pit. That's today. We're in that thousand years. The devil and his angels. So there are some limitations put upon them. A binding which God has sent to them, put upon them. So who are these demons? They are the, the minions of the devil. It's who the devil uses. It's his resources at his fingertips, at his beck and call, that reaches out and tempts us to engage. Oh, I'll have my mark on. I better stay here. That tempts us to engage in sin. And so, the encouragement to each one of us is: know your adversary, know the devil, and know his demons. Not to embrace them, but to shun them and keep them at bay. If tonight, maybe you're struggling with the temptations of the devil. Maybe they've been clouding your mind, covering your eyes, and blinding you to the righteousness of God. And you're ready to put a stop to it. There is clarity for us in His Word. And if we will come to it, and we will follow it, and embrace it, then we will, in fact, be saved by God. If tonight you are not saved, you can be. The grace of God is waiting for you to obey His gospel, believing in His Son, repenting of your sins, confessing Him before the congregation here and being baptized for the remission of your sins. God will wash away every indiscretion, every sin, every iniquity, and hold you guiltless even though you are guilty. Don't you want to stand before Him whole and complete? Meet for heaven. If you have a need, won't you come while we stand and while we sing?